Okay, so let's get started. Um, I'm really very pleased that uh, so many of you are joining us for this first of our Lunch and Learns around being a bank on the Singterra platform. And we'll get into quite a bit of detail around what you have to do and how you have to get started and what's involved. But at, suffice it to say, our job at Singterra is to make it as easy as possible. And we want you to be part of this new uh, revolution that's happening in banking and this transition from as a bank moving from where you have consumers at your retail bank, you may have uh, small businesses in a business or commercial division, you might even have a private bank. And now we're suggesting there's a new type of bank relationship that you can have, which is called fintech banking. So that's where we're starting from. And what we want to do through this conversation is really talk through what it takes, what you have to do. Um, what are the steps, uh, pragmatic and practical, um, and get into the detail there. And if you have questions, uh, feel free to uh, send them in the chat um, and we can open up and see if there's any particular uh, topics along the way. And this is meant to be dialogue-y, even though it's kind of hard to do with a webinar on Zoom, uh, but it's great to see uh, so many of you in the audience today. It's really cool. Uh, a little bit about me, notwithstanding the sort of weird headshot. Um, I, we started Syncterra about a year and a bit ago, uh, focused in on bridging the gap between fintechs and community banks. Um, my background is the last couple of years, I worked at Uber, running Uber Money, which is the payments and risk part of Uber, focused on building money flows across the globe so they could have as seamless an experience as possible. Basically 70 countries, everything from wallets to uh, every different payment method you can imagine. Before that, I had a couple of years at Google uh, where I worked on uh, Google Wallet and launching tap and pay and getting consumers to try something different with their phone. I spent seven years at Yodli building online banking, bill pay funds transfer and so forth with the really big banks at Yodli. Had a stint at Nokia, and way back when I began uh, here in the US, uh, I built the first Windows-based core banking system. So been there, done that in different sorts of categories. And what I'm excited about with us at Sinterra is it's the opportunity to see the intersection of all of those different experiences that I've had. So anyway, let's sort of begin at the beginning. What do we think FinTech banking is in the first place? Um, by anti-definition, the first thing it isn't is open banking. So you, many of you may have heard of open banking, particularly if you have connections to Europe or LATAM. And open banking really is the concept of letting banks and or credit unions expose their um, data to their customers through standardized APIs. And if you think of Plaid or Yodli or Finicity as a combination of data feeds and scraping that allows um, fintechs to access data, open banking is um, a very unique sort of extension to this that was pioneered first in Europe with the uh, formation of PSD2, and then uh, sort of cloned and copied across the globe as a way of saying banks and credit unions, you have to share this data with the consumer. It's their right to have access to it. And, um, and we're gonna make you do it with a standard set of APIs that everyone has to use. Um, it hasn't come to the US. Banks in the US are talking about doing it but there's no standardization, it's a pretty generic model. And what it's evolved into in, in Europe is the ability to also initiate payments on behalf of the consumers with their accounts. And so that's pretty interesting as well. Uh, Fong, I'm not sure, is, is there anybody else having problems hearing my voice? I think you're fine, it's a little crackly. Um, so I'm not sure if it's on your end. Uh, okay. You're, you're on. pretty. You're pretty easy here. Let's try one other set of headphones, one sec. Sounds good. All right, is that better or worse? Um, it's definitely not worse and it might be better. Okay, so. all right, well, let's keep going. Yeah. All right, Thank very you. good. So I'm tossing these other AirPods away apparently. Okay, awesome. All right, so the next thing that uh, fintech banking isn't is embedded finance. So fintech banking could be embedded finance, but it's not per se. So think of embedded finance as 
big corporations and other existing businesses wanting to add bank payments or banking services to their existing experiences. The classic example is um, Square expanding from just doing card processing and stuff like that to enabling small businesses to run their business and so on. Uh, we've seen a lot of extensions from trucking companies and other verticals where they have relationships with their customers. And they're focused in on how do we expand the capabilities of those truckers to give them lines of credit, overdraft, and so on. But summary is fintech banking isn't just embedded finance. And it's not just banking as a service. So think of banking as a service as the first phase um, of folks that were in banks and saying, okay, with now the Durban regulation in 2011, I have the ability to leverage the fact that I'm a community bank and I can rent my charter or loan my charter to a fintech and we'll rev share on interchange. And that was certainly a great start and uh, certainly something that has evolved. Banking as a service has probably 40 or so banks here in the US doing it right now. The focus and the distribution of work and so forth was roughly split between the bank who has the ultimate compliance responsibilities to make sure that money laundering doesn't happen and uh, compliance of KYC and, and federal regulations is performed. But fraud and operational risk was something that the fintechs had to do. So fintech banking is an expanded universe that includes not just banking as a service, not just embedded finance, but it's a full stack or a set of capabilities that the bank can offer to their fintech partners that ranges from the entire stack of everything that the fintech would need. And that includes basic things like um, waitlist management, KYC support, everything you need to do to manage a debit or credit card on behalf of the customers, all the standard things around managing a ledger and transactions and statements and so forth. And the evolution here and what we're doing at Singterra is saying, we, Singterra will build this two-sided marketplace where on one side of the marketplace, you have all the fintechs who are coding to our APIs that cover all of these capabilities. And on the other side of the marketplace are the banks who are selling the Singterra platform to those community fintechs. And the upside of this is as a bank, you now have to, the ability to maintain a relationship with your fintech. You're signing a contract with them and you're cut into the entire revenue stream. So it's no longer just the basics of sharing interchange, it's everything in it as well. And this has become a really significant incremental rev share that you're gonna get with your bank and fintech partnership. So then the next question is like, why a marketplace and, and what is the point of that? So in fintech banking, uh, as a bank, you need to think about a couple of things. One, you need to make sure your bank is kept operationally sound and safe so that if a fintech does something silly or unsafe, you're protected against them and you can spot and observe when things go wrong. On the other side, if you're a fintech and you're looking at finding a bank partner, the challenge is how do you find them? And if you could find them, how do you get access to them and relationships? What we've done with the marketplace is say, we want to bring a central place where both fintechs and banks can meet in the middle. And we can align, we, excuse me, we can align uh, the banks and the fintechs based on the partnership dynamics and what the services that are wanted. So some fintechs will say, hey, I really need a bank that's comfortable with remittances. And not all of our bank partners will say, we want to do remittances. And banking as a rule is a game of risk taking, whether you want to be super conservative and say, I only want really, really gold plated deposit accounts, or I want to be quite aggressive on risk and consider banking cannabis fintechs. Our job in the middle in this marketplace mode is to figure out how do we get the best price as in the highest price for the bank and at the same time, the lowest price for the fintech. What we do in the middle is we operate the tech stack for both parties so that the meeting in the middle is contracts and relationship and pricing. It's not like, how does it work? We handle all of that. That's the goal of the marketplace. So let's say you're in this game and you said, hey, I'm a bank and I wanna start working with FinTechs. The question is, how do you do that? What do you have to do? And what are all the categories of problems you need to go solve? And there's quite a few. One um, sort of checkpoint in 
this process is, as we started Sinkterra, we were really, really lucky to be able to partner with Coastal Community Bank um, because they gave us a whole bunch of context and experience that they've developed themselves since launching their service in 2015. And what's been really great about that experience is we've been able to learn along the way what other fintechs may be having questions about and challenges with. And that's been able to allow us to um, figure out what's the most important thing to do, what matters now, and what's not necessary. Um, nothing better than having a practical beginning. So in an overstep, in a sort of a high level review, the three things that you've got to think about is, do you want to do it at all? What's, what's in it for you as a bank? And if you are going to do it, how you go to market? And then once you've said, I'm going to market, how do you operationalize things? And that's what we're going to talk through today. So let's assume you're a community bank or a regional bank, and you're thinking to yourself, okay, why do I want to do fintech banking? I think the way to think about fintech banking is it's a new channel. It's a new line of business. It's really a separate set of revenue that can come into you as a bank. And if you get it right, what you want to do is figure out how much you want to spend on it versus how much return you expect to get from it. The simple answer is for every user that a fintech consumer generates, sorry, like a fintech like a neobank generates, you're going to be cut into a whole bunch of different sorts of revenue lines that come from that, whether it's rev sharing on the fees for KYC, if it's rev sharing on the ledger fees, if it's rev sharing on fraud and AML transaction monitoring fees, or the obvious things like rev shares on interchange and payment volumes and so forth. There's a straight line here that just says, here is new revenue that previously would be inaccessible to you as a bank. And many of our community banks that we're talking to have come to this market with the conclusion that as a community bank, we have an organic growth plan and it is X. We think of Sinkterra and FinTech banking as a completely augmentative new line of business that generates 2X or 3X revenue independently of anything else that's going on. And that's really attractive to the banks. The second thing that may be interesting for many of the community banks that we talk to is access to deposits. Um, and, and uh, growing their deposit base. Not all banks want to do this. Many banks are still flush with the money from the stimulus that's happened as a result of COVID. But we're seeing increasingly uh, banks starting to bolster up their lending business and needing deposits as a way to um, offset some of the risk with the Fed and others. The last thing is, if you want to do fintech banking, you've got to think about uh, the opportunities to help scale your business. We have a couple of banks that we've been working with that have organic growth plans of 500 to 1,000 accounts per week. And yet uh, their fintech businesses are growing at 50 to 100,000 accounts a week. And as you think about all of these different dynamics, part of the scalability will then change your posture with your regulators um, as you get bigger and larger. And you'll need to have some support in thinking about how do you manage that change and that transition. It's pretty interesting. Um, of the first few banks that we've been working with, it's pretty bifurcated between um, the two or three community banks we're working with that have already done fintech banking before and the two or three that are launching with us that are brand new to the marketplace. The needs are the same, the goals are the same, which is you want to grow your revenue base. You, you don't want to try and play um, the existing banking business. You don't want to necessarily go and try and buy another branch or expand in that way. And this is the ability for us to grow in an inorganic manner. And when you think about, now you said, yes, I want to do this. Effectively, there are three choices. Choice A, somehow build it yourselves and integrate into your core banking platform, whether it's Fiserv, FIS, or Finastra. Uh, the second choice is an FBO account structure where you set up a giant checking account that represents the sum of all the balances of the consumers that you're working with. And the third plan is to do something uh, with players like digital providers that sit in the middle and do all of this activity for you. And we'll talk through what each of those options feel like. So um, integration with the core provider is the idea where every new consumer that joins the FinTech gets added to the core banking system of your bank. And what you need to do on your side as a bank is build or acquire an API layer for the FinTechs to talk to. You're going to actually have to tell the core banking platform that you need to do it. And then you're probably going to have to figure out 
um, how to certify each fintech for that they're using your platform safely and securely. The downsides are you're going to spend a lot of time uh, working with your core providers to get integration programs approved and, con and considered. It's going to cost you a lot of money and it'll slow you down your time to market. And as an example of this, most fintech cons uh, fintechs are expecting to pay between 50 and 75 cents for what's called like an account maintenance fee or a ledger fee. And as a bank, normally what would happen is if you added a consumer to your bank in this model with connecting to the core provider, you would end up paying Fiserv or FIS that same 50 to 75 cents. So effectively it's a wash. You get a 75 cent fee from the fintech, you pass it through basically to the core provider. The, what, what happens in our model is we've built a brand new ledger that is completely freestanding from the core platform. So instead of um, passing through the money earned for the ledger fees to your provider, you now get that as revenue to you as a bank. And that's a really interesting di difference. Uh, there's a question that's been brought up by Brian, which is what impact would this augmented revenue stream have on the bank's valuation? Have you seen this play out in the market? Um, so Brian, I think the easiest answer to that is that if you look at the folks like Bank Corp and Green Dot and others uh, that have um, been quite aggressive for quite some time in the, um, the banking as a service or new revenue types of businesses, or if you look at Coastal that has, that's public and has um, been successful launching their CCBX group, um, I think the valuation on the bank has been positive and impactful. Exact data on that, couldn't tell you off the top of my head, but it's definitely clear that there's a value to the bank to be offering new lines of revenue that augment what they're doing in their total regular business. The second sort of structure that can be interesting to look through is the FBO account structure. And really this is the alternative to adding it directly to your core. Effect effectively what happens is you set up four or five accounts for each of the fintechs, one representing a settlement to uh, MasterCard or Visa, one representing settlement to the Fed, one representing the FBO balance of all of the accounts of the consumers, and then a reserve account. So in general, as a bank, you're not gonna be on the hook for things like fraud or credit cards being stolen, things like that to the consumer. The losses for those, including the losses of un unsettled loan risk are borne by the fintechs. As bankers, what you're gonna to wanna to do is make sure that you have um, created a reserve that represents a risk adjusted sense of doing business. The FinTechs will obviously want the smallest reserve, you guys will want the biggest reserve, and that matching process will be really important. The, on the bill side of things, you'll actually work with the FinTech to ingest some of their operating technology. So the FinTech may be themselves running on something like FinZact or some other core banking system. And so at the end of each business day, you're going to have to build the technology to ingest those tech files for ACH and payments. The FBO side of setup is pretty basic and you need to do that generally. Ledger and reconciliation becomes a non-trivial task, which is the FinTech themselves maintains a ledger. And at the end of the day, they say, here are all the transactions. Here's what I think the balances are. And you, the bank, have to sit there and say, yeah, I agree or no, I don't. And how do you describe it? The upside of this model is it's definitely faster than working with your core providers, uh, but you still have a bunch of integration work and you still have a bunch of operational costs that you need to absorb and figure out. So the third option, which we think is the best option is to work with a digital provider, someone like us that can deal with all of the complexity around how to set things up, how to manage the FinTechs, how to go to market quickly, and also how to build a marketplace where you as a bank don't have to think about how do I find fintechs that wanna be on my platform? We do all of that for you. The main goal and the main objective that you will have as bankers is compliance oversight. So the ability to watch that a fintech is doing the right level of scrutiny on KYC, observe that they're doing well on their fraud management, mandatorily look at every AML incident and decide whether you wanna file a SAR and generally manage overall bank risk with the fintech overall. Um, partners like providers like us will help you uh, impact or uh, implement those compliance rules and we will help standardize that the fintechs coming to you have the same behavior and the same experience. The upside of doing this is it's by far the fastest time to, to market. Um, our first couple of banks that we've come online 
uh, are doing their first fintechs as we speak. And I would say it's been about a 60 to 90, maybe even a little bit more time to market as we've just, as we collectively are learning how to do it. Our expectation is for a new bank, once they've signed with us, to have their first fintech in market within 60 days by early Q1 of next year, which is super exciting. The operational costs are really low. Um, the thing that you have to think about is how do you distinguish between Sinterra or Synapse or Bond or anybody else? And that's where I think education and understanding what's in it for you, what the pros and cons are, and we'll talk about those things over time, um, become important. Obviously, I'm fairly bullish on what we're doing at Sinterra and think we're the right choice for everybody. But there may be some scenarios where there's a different provider that might be more relevant to your needs as a bank. Assuming you've done that, now you actually have to think how you're going to operate this business. And this is what we mean by program setup. And there's three big buckets of this work. One is thinking about how you want to shape and schedule and organize governance. Think of that as the compliance overviews and the rules of how you want to operate and what you want to do with your fintech partners. The second part is literally at the end of every business day, what do you have to do? And there will be some tasks. There'll be some activities of picking up files from MasterCard and dropping them off in FTP locations for somebody to ingest into a ledger and so forth. And then pretty importantly, uh, there'll be a whole bunch of work you need to define policies and procedures to help describe who has responsibility for what activity across all of these different uh, interactions. Who is going to be responsible for reviewing a transaction for fraud? Who is going to be responsible for setting the policies for how you do the review of the fraud? And, and then who's going to double check that the procedures are being followed. And so, um, so that's kind of the three big buckets. And so we can dial into that. On the governance and oversight, I think the, the key thing is that when you get started, you're going to want to sign somebody that's in charge of this business. You want a general manager, someone who uh, is focused on innovation, maybe new to the bank, uh, doesn't have to be an existing bank person, but has some sort of connection to the fintech economy is probably a good thing and wants to think about how to run the business as their own PL. The key goal there is to set out a strategy. If the strategy is you want to get to a place where you're onboarding a new fintech one a month, that could be one strategy. It could be a strategy of saying, we're going to be um, managing our risk here and we're not going to do anyone in remittances or crypto. Uh, and we're not going to do cannabis, so we're going to take straightforward deposit wallets and things like that. But you need to clearly out at the front start to say what your goal is. Our job at Sinterra is to make it as easy as possible for you to say yes to as many people as possible on the fintech side. And so what you want to ultimately do is set up, just like in any small uh, new starting startup or venture funded business, you want to say, by the end of this first year, I want to have... 50,000 consumers on my fintech banking platform or 100,000 or 1 million. And whatever those are, those goals become the building blocks for how aggressive or how um, interested you are in picking up different fintechs with different capabilities. At the same time, you want to start to figure out what your risk framework is. So how are you going to evaluate uh, what risk is being assumed or taken by a particular fintech? And throughout all of this, we give you, Sinterra gives you, uh, all the process and understanding of how to figure out what risk you're taking. And we'll give you a playbook to help this get forward. If you think about the key roles and activities that you want to do every day, you probably won't know what all of those things are. Again, Sintera will help you figure out how to define all the roles that you need. And in practical terms, you need one or two folks that are going to sit there and do AML and KYC reviews. So effectively compliance oversight. Uh, maybe they're also someone sitting there thinking about language around UDAP and making sure that marketing materials are truthful and fair. Um, and then you're gonna need some folks in accounting slash finance that are going to sit there and say at the end of every business day, are we in balance? Do we know where all the money is? And so forth. That's it from a nutshell, plus a GM to run the business. Over time, as the business gets bigger, you'll scale that team at some ratio of FinTech to, consume, to worker or team member over time. Assuming you've done all of this, process and you've identified who's responsible for what, uh, then you actually need to get your board to agree. And then you may actually have to go to your regulators and give them feedback on your adding this to your business and you're uh, trying a new type of um, business to be launched. So most regulators will want to be notified 
that you're actually doing something different. Um, and then it's pretty straightforward, get in there and hire the people and start to grow. On the policy side of things, there's quite a few things that you need to think about. Um, and we've got a whole playbook that we can give you as we go forward. But in a nutshell, there's a whole bunch of stuff around maintaining compliance uh, and managing risk from a Fed and, and OCC, et cetera, perspective, particularly around uh, the Bank Secrecy Act and anti-money laundering. There's a bunch of work that you want to put in place around InfoSec, so making sure the fintech um, doesn't leak data and get things in place. Uh, there's work you want to do to make sure that somebody is doing TPRM, third-party risk management, of all the vendors and all the fintech vendors. All of this stuff then culminates in a package of due diligence. And our team at Sigterra takes each fintech, we run them through a, an overview of all of this stuff, we prepare for you a risk due diligence package as part of the bidding process. You also want to make sure at the end of the day that there's some um, viability of the fintech that you're working with and or with yourselves. And last but not least, there's brand and, and, and language risk around what claims a fintech may make. For example, if the fintech says, we're gonna pay 10% interest, but you can't actually do that in practical terms, you, the bank, have a responsibility to make sure they don't make claims that aren't true. Operationally, the big buckets of work that you need to do every day are around reconciliation. So making sure that the banks data and totals match what the fintech says they are. The classic example of this is, let's say the fintech's doing really well and they launch a give 10, get 10 program, meaning that every time a, a friend is referred to the fintech, $10 is deposited into the, the customer's hands. At the end of a business day, if they've done a thousand of those, the bank will be out of balance in their FBO by the fintech by $10,000, reflecting the $10, 10 times a thousand people. So we highlight that for you. We encourage, we then make it easy for you to identify what internal transfer might need to happen from the reserve account of the FinTech to the bank's FBO account. So at the end of the night, all the money ticks and ties from an FDIC insurance perspective. We've talked about it a little bit around what you have to do on the KYC and BSA side of things, but effectively what happens is if the FinTech is launching um, a new service, a whole bunch of users go through KYC, a bunch of them will fail KYC for legitimate reasons like first name, last name didn't match, address on file different, that sort of thing. Some users will get flagged for um, secondary review. And the solution to that is also automated on a platform. So you can ask the FinTech to ask the consumer to submit a driver's license or a passport or some additional documentation. But ultimately at some point, some users are gonna flag as um, an interesting person on the OFAC list or the PEP screen or whatever. And you as a bank will have the responsibility to look at that and make a decision do you want to bank this consumer, yes or no? And, uh, and or do you need to file a SAR as required if you see transactions that are interesting that you need to look at? The other aspect of this will be customer support. And really this is tier three customer support. So tier one customer support will be handled by the FinTech. Tier two, which is, hey, the FinTech says, I can't find this, eight, this debit card, where is it? That will be us at Singterra. But ultimately at the back end, there will be a case where somebody says, hey, I wanna shut down my account. I don't like my FinTech, how do I deal with that? So we help you with all of those things. But it's also important to say, what parts are you gonna do and what are your parts you're gonna make the FinTech do? So you can push off almost all customer care onto the FinTech and ideally you're never being contacted directly. It's only uh, you are supporting the bank. You're sorry, you're supporting the FinTech to help them. On the due diligence side of things, as you're deciding whether you want to accept a fintech uh, and make a bid for their service or not, you're going to want to have a team that just says, I read the due diligence packet from Zingterra, it works for me, or I have these incremental questions. And then on your side, you're going to want to make sure that you as a business bank have the resources to continue to support the business of the fintechs that are growing. And some of these fintechs will grow quite quickly. And so may test some of your capital ratios and other things that you may not need to think about. And last but not least, as we talked about, you'll have a team that needs to sit there and make approval decisions on marketing materials. All of these decisions and all of these activities are handled through the Sinterra dashboard. So we have one single consolidated place where you can see everything from documents ready for review, customer support incidents that aren't getting satisfied quickly enough, a KYC transact, uh, user that needs uh, review, or a transaction that's maybe fraudulent. All of these things are transparent and easy to see. So you don't have to think about how am I going to build that technology or how am I going to integrate it into something that I have at the bank. It's all freestanding. It's on our platform. 
So summary, why are we doing fun fintech banking? Because it's basically giving you this new line of business, this new way of getting new types of revenue that are unique and special. Uh, we at Sintera go and let you have access to the entire revenue stream from every sort of aspect of things that the fintech would pay for. And what we want to make sure it's really easy for you to do is to manage your compliance and risk obligations, um, which are a non-zero. So you have to think about what you have, what you're going to do, how you're going to operate, who's ultimately responsible. Uh, but we give you that playbook. We give you the, the tools you need to do that. And at the same time, what we really strive to do is then match you to your perfect fintech. So if you think of the marketplace as having all different sorts of ideas, we've heard from several fintechs that say, hey, we really want to work with an MNDI bank. And because uh, our founders are aligned based on principles or ethics or even cultural backgrounds. And so our job at Sintera is to figure out how to bridge that gap. So the fintech says they are really keen to support the LGBTQ model and, and market and have really strong values that they want to enforce on their bank partners. We do that as well. So a lot of different sort of alignment based on risk, appetite as well. So that's it in a really fast session. I'm going to stop my sharing and pause and say, what can I tell you? You got any questions? And if folks want to put it in the chat, that's fine. Or the Q&A. Ah, here's a good question from Brian Kreps. Um, he asks, uh, worst case scenario, how do you unwind an unsuccessful FinTech? So the, the reality is some will fail. And the question is now what? The simplest answer is um, because you're gonna have the deposit balances on file, the, the super simple, the FinTech has completely died and gone, gone away, is you as a bank are responsible for sending effectively cashier's checks in the amount of the balance of the consumer and you close their accounts. You, there's no upside to try and rehome those accounts to somewhere else. The FinTech themselves may choose to try and sell themselves to another FinTech. And then at that point, you're gonna have a conversation around where do the accounts live? Because maybe the other FinTech is with another bank. Um, but in practical terms, if the FinTech is having a graceful shutdown, they're gonna pose a message to their customers saying, hey, I'm sorry, it didn't work out. We're going to send you your money back. And then we, we would work with you to generate a list of um, checks that need to be written to be sent out. So that's the answer to your question, Brian. Uh, so let me answer Terry's question first. So Terry asks, during the FinTech acquisition process, you use the phrase as part of the bidding process. Please explain. So. Terry, um, the way we build the marketplace is the following. We think Terra give all of the APIs the FinTech needs to the FinTechs to build, and that's how they get started. When they've done some building and or at the earliest stages, we then say, okay, we're going to help you find a bank to be your partner. And the way that's accomplished is we take the FinTech's profile data, the information, we do some due diligence and so forth. And then we reach out to all of you as banks on our platform. We say, hey, here comes this FinTech, this is what they look like. We're not gonna really tell you who they are because we want to sort of preserve a little bit of um, no bias on what they're doing or who they are, but we'll give you all the information you need to make a decision. And then what we give you as bankers is we give you all of the tech stack at cost, and then you get to choose what price you set when you give it to the FinTechs. So take, take as a starting point, the ledger. The ledger comes at a cost of zero from Sinterra. The fintechs are expecting to spend 50 cents to 75 cents. When you price, and we'll help you do all the pricing, we'll tell you, here's what you have to price for KYC, here's what you price for something like Ledger. You, you can choose to set the Ledger price at 10 cents, 50 cents, 75 cents, two bucks. We'll tell you what's market and what's interesting. And um, at that point, whatever price you set, we then, assuming the fintech does business with you, we share with you the upside 50-50. So take as another example, um, 
uh, interchange revenue that you earn from the, the process of working with issuing debit cards. The interchange you get on a consumer debit is about 140 bips. Uh, on a commercial debit, it's about 240 bips. The fintech is going to expect between low side 70%, high side 90% of the interchange as theirs, which means when you're bidding to the fintech, if you think they're really large, you're going to be probably more generous. You're going to say, I'll give you 85% or even give you 90%. And whatever's left over, the 10% or 15%, we rev share with you, Singtera and you, 50 50. At the same time, there's a whole bunch of other services that previously under Bass you wouldn't see as um, something that you get access to. For example, we're also the card processor. And the fintech, once they receive their 100 bips or you know 90% of the interchange, then has to acquire card processing technology. And the market price for that's about 30 bips. So what the fintech themselves is expecting to clear net-net is about 75 to 80 bips total, maybe down to 65, depending on how big and small they are. And the upside for us is our cost for offering card processing is between 12 and 18 bips, depending on volume. So this is again, a place where we share another rev share between 30 minus 18, so 12 bips, 50-50 with you as the bank. So every place where the FinTech spends money, we've got an API offering. Think of them as needing to do account verification. There's a market price of that. Um, and we've, we've sourced the products and the technology and we've built it and we offer it to you as a bank at wholesale. And again, it's this market optimization. Think of it as, as a bank, you now have a variety of services you can sell to the fintechs. It gets sold as a package, uh, representing everything from ACH processing to wires, to sending in a debit or a credit to a debit card, things like that. And our job is to make it really easy for you to understand what all those costs are help you price and our job is to optimize to get you the highest price while also getting the fintech the best price hopefully that explains terry all right uh i'm going to go to antonio's question so antonio says sorry antonio um says what do the regulators think about the bank that works with the fintech are they open to it um i think antonio the answer is there's a lot of um very uh great dialogues that are happening with regulators these days Many folks like the Fed and the FDIC are starting to publish um, guidance on how you should treat your fintechs and, um, and are taking a proactive approach of saying, here are the things we need you to look into. Here are the governance things we have questions about. Here's the things we expect you to look into based on uh, the support and the functionality that the fintech is doing. Here's what you need to be careful about to make sure that the fintech has been reviewed for all of their tech stacks. Um, so, but generally speaking, regulators are, as in our observation, are positive about the marketplace and are keen to just help provide more guidance on how to run as a bank and how to bring things together. Um, so moving on to a question from anonymous attendee. Can you speak to the flexibility of your platform to allow a FinTech to do things like splitting deposits across multiple banks? So great question. So we've built our platform from the ground up to support the idea of a fintech that wants to have multiple banks on the back end to either de-risk um, the, the probability of some bank getting in trouble with a regulator and or getting sold out for business. Some of you guys may have noticed there have been some very successful community banks doing fintech banking that have basically gone berserk with their customers and now are having a hard time banking other customers until they fix their ratios of function of money across the bank and capital and all those sorts of things. And so by design, we've, we've built this way. We've done a special relationship with MasterCard to no longer require the bank name to be printed on the physical card. So not only do you have the flexibility in software, but now you have it in quote hardware. So you have one printed card that basically has your brand name on the front, MasterCard on the front or the back, debit somewhere a, and a chip in it or an NFC chip uh, for tap and pay. And you don't have to put, we're not gonna put card numbers on there. We're not gonna have signature blocks. All we're gonna have is the ability to tap or uh, swipe and may not even have mag stripes, that's up to you. But the simplicity of the card design then means that it allows you to have one print run. So when you have multiple banks under the covers, there's a related question of, does this trigger broker deposits? And uh, we're happy to talk to you about strategies around that from a bank's perspective and also the fintech's perspective. But we think we have some really good, interesting ways of 
meeting the goal of the fintech to have multiple banks on the back end for both risk and also price optimization, because we know that some banks may want to bid for other banks' business, which is banking 101. Um, and we're making that possible as well. Um, Keith asks the question, from a talent perspective, what roles are crucial at community banks to partner with fintech successfully? I think the most important person you need to hire is that person that's going to lead the division, lead the group. And that should be, an, by design, an entrepreneurial person that wants to do B2B relationship development because you're effectively going to start forming relationships with each of these fintechs. Um, so they tend to be uh, folks that are either from startup land or um, in, in banking, but have been uh, on a fast track for developing new types of products for the bank. They might come out of IT, but generally this is a business area uh, design. And the other things that are really important at the bank to have uh, people that are well suited in understanding compliance and regulatory constraints so that they can think about how to be the most efficient or effective um, business model so that they're not so, so hard to work with that the fintechs say, hey, this bank's just not worth it. It's, they're too difficult. Um, Charlie asked a couple of questions. Apologies if you <laughs> covered this already, but what is the minimum required tech stank on the bank side to get started with Sintera? The best news is, Charlie, there's zero required on the bank side. We, we are completely freestanding. The only thing we need to know from you as a bank is where do we drop off ACH files for transmission and where do we pick up same day ACH files for posting? Uh, so super lightweight at, uh, on, on that side of things. The next question is, will you be at Money 2020 next week? If so, what booth? So yes, we will. Um, I'll be actually presenting on Monday morning at 9.15. Uh, we don't have a booth, uh, but we are happy to meet with anybody on this call if they want to. And we have uh, a pretty fun party that's on Monday night that's sold out, but I know a person that might be able to bypass that. So if you really want to get access to our party, email me at p at syncterra.com. All right, so we got another question from Brian. Similar line of questioning, what if the FinTech decides they want a new bank partner? This one's a little more interesting, Brian. So in that case, what we believe is the normative flow is, um, first of all, hopefully it's not, got, not because they have a bad relationship with their first bank, because it's much, much smoother if the first bank says, I'm okay with this, I'm happy for you guys to just migrate all the customers over. Ideally, in that scenario, that also mitigates the need to re-KYC the users, which is really unfun and, and, and has a huge drop-off of behavior. But if the bank does, if the fintech does want to have a new bank partner, our job is to either coach them on a migration, which ideally we just do with them on our platform. The worst case scenario, um, you do a user experience where you basically say, hey, if the user sees, hey, we're closing our bank relationship here, we're adding our new bank relationship here please say yes to approve. And then we'll move your money for you from bank one to bank two. And we'll, on your instruction, you, the consumer are telling us, we'll close your account at bank one and open a new account at bank two. So um, those projects uh, of migration are getting more and more streamlined, uh, but there's still a bunch of work to be done to make it as uh, like an automated process. Um, so, I apologize if I butch your name, but I'm going to go with Chigo Zie. I'm sorry, I, I, it's a toughie to pronounce out loud. Um, the question is, is your onboarding and KYB jurisdictional based? Not quite sure I understand what you're saying, but uh, let me frame it and answer as, for KYC and KYB in, and for all of the fintechs that we work with, the only permitted customer base at this point is customers in the US. So what the bank is saying is, I'm gonna provide banking services to a consumer that's based in the US. If you're outside the US and you want to do remittances and so forth, we have some banks that are interested in working with you about how to create the wallet or the, the domiciled funds in the US. Um, but generally speaking, the remittance types of programs require an incremental work on the uh, compliance side, which we love, we love to support and help you with. Um, but we, Sinterra, are not doing any work outside the US. You would be responsible for producing your funds flows and documentation around what you're doing in other countries in order to keep the, the ecosystem safe. 
Um, and I apologize if I butcher your name again. So Chigozio also asks, are the cards physical and virtual and accounts brandable? 100% yes. So the cards themselves are all in the brand name of the fintech. There's no uh, relationship to the banks at all on the cards. In the T's and C's and in the online app, you'll need to say this account was you know, produced on um, XYZ Bank's charter. And like in all the statements and communication, it'll say banking services provided by bank name X. Um, but that's the extent of the branding that's required for other folks. Uh, Fong asked a question, hey, Peter, I'm a FinTech and we would need to control the deposits from our customers. It sounds like the framework, the bank is keeping the deposit fund inside their bank. There is no way for us to utilize the funds from our customers, not for outside use such as lending out or living in, investing in something outside the system. We'll keep all inside our own repository, but we have our own methodology to maintain the funds our own way. So uh, Fong, if they are deposit accounts for a consumer that are needing to live in a bank account, when it all gets said and done, those account balances have to be at the bank. So um, if you want to do something completely unbanked, that's totally cool. But for the purposes of the normal fintech use case, so think of a Chime or Revolut or whatever, those deposit balances are held and in, in an FDIC-backed uh, FBO bank account at the bank. If you're talking about other types of uh, instruments, whether it's crypto or something else, those can be elsewhere. And in fact, most banks don't want the crypto anywhere near them. So that may be an answer to that. Either way, happy to follow up with you afterwards and see if we can help you think about a little bit more way, uh, more interesting ways to use the money. Sean asks a question, apologies if this has already been covered, but how long would the FI have to vet and respond to a potential FinTech match? Great question. Um, at the moment, we're sort of looking in the sort of two to five day type of time frame, So it's pretty quick, um, but we give you almost everything you would have needed to do to do your due diligence. And, um, and, and the good news, bad news is at the moment where we're, there's like a huge amount of demand. So if you're a bank thinking about doing this, know that uh, last quarter we signed, I think 14 FinTechs to our platform and they're all looking for homes. Uh, many of them have already landed on a home with a bank, which is great. This quarter, I'm expecting us to sign 20 or more. And so the velocity is increasing and this is before we've even started selling. So next year, my expectation is we'll be looking to onboard and go live at a range of 10 to 20 FinTechs a month, which means um, we will do everything we can to streamline the information sharing so that it is um, makes it super easy for you to make a choice around what you want to do and how you want to do it. Um, hopefully that helped answer, Sean. All right, uh, Jason asks a question. If the FinTech is purchased, what happens to the accounts? Do you expect the bank to lose both revenue and deposits? Um, so I guess it depends. So generally speaking, acquisitions of FinTechs by one another, the underlying bank tends to get merged. If, if, you're, a commu if you're the FinTech that's the acquirer, you're probably doing it to bolster your existing business. And operationally, you're probably not going to want to have two different tech stacks. If both of the fintechs are powered by Sintera, no brainer, easy, will help you make it, make you whole. But at some point, um, yeah, if fintech is banked by bank A powered by Sintera and fintech two buys fintech one and fintech two is powered by somebody else or they've built their own stack, it's not unreasonable to expect that at some point, three months, six months, nine months later, those accounts would migrate away from um, bank A to bank B. I think that's the last of the questions. I'm glad that Chico Zia said I didn't completely butcher his name or her name, sorry, I actually don't know. Um, so without much further ado, we've got eight minutes left. I really appreciate uh, uh, the long list of folks that have participated today. And hopefully we've looked at um, giving you a, a little short primer on what we do. Happy to follow up with you directly. Um, and uh, hopefully you can join us and start to bank some of the fintechs that are looking for a home because it's pretty crazy right now. We really need your help. Awesome. Hey, have a great day, people. And um, look forward to seeing any and all of you in Vegas. Come to our party, Money 2020, and be great to hang out with you. See you later. Bye-bye.